Two, three, four. So the order was Dio Tokyo and Bow the Visitor first, then Dragon's Haven and Project Echo after the intermission. Um, I want to save Bow the Visitor for last because it's going to be a big for a good transition segue. Uh, but Neo Tokyo was a is an anthology film, basically about an hour ish in runtime, um, with segments by. Katsuhiro Otomo, Yoshiaki Kawajiri, and Rintaro. Uh, Rintaro does the framing story. And then um, Kawajiri does a short called The Running Man. I don't know if you ever, if you watched Liquid Television on MTV back in the day. Oh, that that takes me back. Could it date me if I said yes? <laughs> uh, I, I, I would date you if you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Says... My husband. Yes. <laughs> so the running man as a moderately hit was separated from the rest of the um, uh, anthology had a moderately heavy rotation on MTV's liquid television. Um, in particular, so this is a one about a basically a futuristic racing circuit called the Death Circus, where um, like on one night one of the drivers who's been in it the longest. Turns out to be a psychic, and he psychically destroys all the other cars on the track uh, on the track before then self-destructing. Like Fury uh, Road plus Akira kind of situation. Kinda. Um, <laughs> and again, this this is this is Yoshiaki Kawajiri directing this segment, so it has the visual flourishes that you expect of Kawajiri. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll we'll get to talk about Kawajiri itself at some point in the future because I know we're going to talk about Demon City Shinjuku at some point. Um, and then the uh, Otomo sort is much more of a sat a satire. Uh, it's called Order to Stop Construction. Um, this one I actually heard also heard, hadn't seen, but I heard of by reputation. Um, it's based on a manga that uh, uh, Otomo did, and it has this basically low level corporate salary man who's sent to this. Um, fictional South American country where the company is running this big construction project in the middle of the jungle that's run entirely by robots and they've lost contact with it and the and because the government's been overthrown they've decided to shut down the project so the guy is sent to shut to shut it down only the robot uh, foreman has taken over the project and decided that absolutely nothing is going to stop the project from proceeding on schedule, even if it's all the robots getting worked to the point of destruction. And so the guys then got to go try and break out and get to the central computer with basically a pipe wrench and smash everything, and shut things down HAL 9000 style. That is uh, swinging for the fences on big concepts. <laughs> yep. Uh, that one is that one was fun. Um, so to do the third again, so not going to still in order. Dragon's Heaven was a um, financed by a model kit company, um, and the director of that one was a mechanical designer and a whole bunch of other anime. And this show short looks basically like it had been done by Moby, like all the design work had been done by Mobius. It has like that particular huh, cool. texture uh, that all of Mobius's stuff does. Also, it has the Mobius hat. If you, <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the particular phallic type hat that shows up in every single one of Mobius's works. Um, whether, a thing. <laughs> like, like whether it's Arzak, it shows up in his concept design work for Tron. Um, it, it's, it is in all of them. Um, it's also known for like a big like robot puppetry opening segment that basically is a robot kind of powering up. Um, and that's kind of the, the other, and that, that's over the main credits. That's the other thing it's especially known for. Um, and then Bow the Visitor. So Bow the Visitor is a anime adaptation of the manga that Hirohiko Araki did before he did JoJo's. Um... And it came out basically at the time Stardust, like a little into when Stardust Crusaders started running in uh, 
Shonen Jump. And basically the premise of it is this um, Japanese kid has been experimented on by this evil teenager, and by kid I mean teenager, uh, has been experimented on by this evil government or, or um, secret society conspiracy thing with alien technology basically turning him into like a common writer type thing. Um, and so he's got this alien parasite in him and more or less when the plot requires it, he develops new special powers to allow him to spectacularly murder whatever opponent he's going up against. Familiar. <laughs> um, and it's like, Oh, all of the, like, this is the one which definitely benefited by seeing in a packed house theater because whenever our main character busts out some new power, uh, the audience just cheered. It's like, oh, <laughs> and now he pulls out um, blades from his shoulders. Again, like, there's, you definitely see some connections here between this and JoJo's. Like, he has, like, he gets the arm blades that ACDC has um, uh, from the Pillar Men. I think he even didn't. I think it was ACDC who also had the uh, shooting hair, um, or spikes from his hair. Was it him who had the shooting hair? Yeah, ACDC basically had could do everything the others could do. <laughs> yeah. So, so in addition like, to his own nonsense. <laughs> yeah. So basically, he gets like basically he like the majority of the powers for the Pillar Men more or less um, show up with. Um, bow first. Um, excuse me. And like it, it doesn't have any like the musical shout out names, um, in it that uh, JoJo's has, um, except for a character named Walken, which is probably the uh, which is probably our our main shout out name, because he's like he's, he's named after Christopher Walken. Um, but otherwise, it's like. Like that's the main thing going on there for the shout outs. It's really over the top. It's a very brisk forty eight minutes. Um and like it, it definitely does not overstay its welcome, which is good. So and like there's a reason to say about every five to ten minutes someone or something is getting horrifically murdered. So like you do. A roaring rampage of revenge. <laughs> Pretty much. Now, eventually, evil companies are going to realize if they're going to test giving people superpowers, make sure those people are loyal. <laughs> I mean, at least this is what's happened. I mean, Kamen Rider, Cyborg 009, Giver. <laughs> I mean, at least with Giver, the, the conspiracy had the. Uh, excuse of we of one of our um, things went walkabout, and yes, why didn't they make sure he was loyal before they turned him into a monster? Well, I think, I'm, 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 seeing as how everyone else in that company loved being a monster, why didn't they give? Why didn't they make sure this guy did too? Yeah, <sighs> don't get me wrong, I love Giver, and I'm sad it will never be finished. Yeah, um, but. Yeah, so, like, in fact, actually, I'd say uh, if you like Giver, um, definitely worth hunting down the uh, anime for Bao. Um, it is, it has, it has some really strong Giver energy to it. That's the biggest comparison I have. The only reason I, only reason I wouldn't say that they were, actually, I'd say that Giver borrows some from Bao because Giver, the manga, started uh, a little after, um, actually, the, uh, actually, no, not a little after, not a little after, just before um, Bao finished. So, like, Bao the manga started in 84. Um, Giver started in February of 85. So, yeah. There's anyway. Very, there's a very interesting conversation to be had and or research to be done on this kind of trope of evil corporations as it pertains to Japanese culture, because here in America, we're, we're just kind of accepting of the fact that corporations are evil and there's not much we can do about it. This is speaking very broadly, mind you. But in Japan, there there's more of an emphasis on corporate culture, so it's it would be interesting to me to see someone break that down. <laughs> that is interesting. Corporate responsibility. Corporate responsibility versus 
being a good little cog in the machine. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting also to look at this from the context of like the Japanese bubble economy and that sort of thing. Because mm-hmm. Bao is absolutely a, in the middle of the bu- bubble economy. Came out in um, again er, uh, mid '80s, so we're kind of coming on the downside of the bubble. But you've also got stuff like if you watch the original Mothra movie, um, there's a lot of bubble eco- uh, like early bubble economy going on in there. Um, so. The relationship to government and corporations in the Godzilla series is fascinating to look at. <laughs> We've yep. watched a number. <laughs> a yes, yes, a number, and that number is all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find the kaiju fascinating. <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah. Okay, yeah, we could do an entire show go just Godzilla retrospective. I think uh, that actually could be like a three-parter. But that's not why. But that's not why today. we're here today. <laughs> that is true. And I, I just want to cut myself off because I can talk about this for a long time. Um, the particularly the first season of the most recent adaptation of the Stardust Crusaders arc um, as we continue the summer of JoJo. So this is actually not the first time that Stardust Crusaders has come to the U.S. Indeed, our first exposure to JoJo was through Stardust Crusaders. Um, We got, uh, in addition to the Capcom fighting game um, for the PlayStation, there was also a anime adaptation of Stardust Crusaders which has a really weird production history. I do want to talk about this real quick. Um, so We're still laughing at the video game. Was it that funny? Yes. But, I mean, the, <laughs> the video game is where the meme comes from. <laughs> um, the whole thing is so memeable. <laughs> but, but the Dio stands. All right. All right. Yeah. So which, oh, sadly, we... Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, Dio stand is going to have to wait because we don't actually get to see Dio stand this season. But to back up a bit, oh, the... uh, I said stance. The Dio okay. stance. Oh, true. The, s- the pose. Yeah. True. We, true. <laughs> yes. We. But we, yes. Also, his stand, which is what the superpowers are called. They're called stands because they stand beside their user. And because uh, Hirohiko Rocky liked that song, "Stand by Me." What? No music. In JoJo? <laughs> uh, so, so the original original adaptation of this came in two chunks. One in 1993 to 1994, which is when the, the Stardust Crusaders was rapping. And then a second, um, that was a chunk of like six or seven episodes. And then the second chunk was in 2000 from um, to 2002. And here's where it gets silly. The arc that came out first adapted the end of Stardust Crusaders, which was contemporarily coming out in the manga at that time. The arc that came out later adapts the beginning of Stardust Crusaders. We didn't eventually get the, this until all of them were out and they put them in order. Uh, but it makes for really weird like stylistic shifts because when the later arc came out, we're starting to get into Digicels and that sort of thing. Whereas when the earlier series came out, we're still traditional cell animation also like because of names we get in the credits like oh uh one of the episodes was co-written by satoshi Kone because at the time that the earlier episode came out or my release order came out he was significantly earlier in his career so like oh yeah i'll take some work or wherever um whereas later we're getting into like his more well-established portion of his career where he's done stuff like perfect blue and that sort of thing and he's now a name um, and that sort of thing. Actually, actually, crow went the wrong term. I uh, he wrote, he uh, storyboarded, and directed uh, one of the ep- one of the early episodes. So, like, that one must have been. I I can barely remember them. Is the issue <laughs> the original? Um, uh, oh man. Also, the original dub cast. Um. Had, does not have any major, um, necessarily like big name um, American voice actors, but what it does have is a whole bunch of like 
video game voice actors. Um, like I want to say, um, uh, Nolan North is on there under a pseudonym. Um, as I, I consider him fairly big name. Yeah, but I mean, he was like, voiced, but not as like Superman. I think that I think that's like. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I said, like, like, fairly big name English voice actors, but not necessarily, uh, like, video game voice actors, oh, but okay. but not in anime. In some cases, the actors, like, had never touched anime at all, and then, oh, they, and they did JoJo. <laughs> um, this is just one of the kind of weird outliers on a lot of people's resumes, I bet. <laughs> um, other significant notable name on here is... Uh, um, music for the earlier OVA was done by Marco D'Ambrosio, who also did the Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust score. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, this DVD release is out of print at the moment. Um, it's like, again, it's a fairly old release, 2000s. Um, this is probably one of those things where if you just keep an eye on eBay or swap meets at conventions, you will probably find a copy eventually, or the convention dealer room. Yeah, because with the obviously newer anime and a much more elaborate uh, adaptation of the story, it's very unlikely we're going to see this re-released. Yeah, unless like somebody like Discotech picks it up or something like that. Um, so for the purposes of this video, we're specifically going to be covering the what is listed as the first season, so the first like twenty four episodes which is known colloquially as the Egypt Arc, which is the trip from Tokyo, Japan, to um, just arriving on Egypt, in Egypt, like, basically get, like, at on the shores of the Red Sea. An odyssey-like journey. <laughs> uh, the, the particular explicit comparison they make is to um, Around the World in 80 Days, days yeah. which... Oh, yep, very much so. <laughs> yeah, like, like, this is definitely, like, like, this is probably the one season, like, one of the seasons of JoJo's where they truly wear their influences in terms of stylistic, like, for the narrative thrust of the series on its sleeve. Like, there's some Indiana Jones elements in um, Battle Tendency. There is plenty of hammer horror and kung fu elements in um, Phantom Blood, but this is, like, much more explicitly around the world in 80 days. Um... But yeah, let's talk about the stands a bit. Like this is like this is the thing that Dom that that but like, JoJo's as a franchise is known for from here out. Um like Ripple still is a bit of a thing here, because we have um also, this, is, this is the first series with two JoJo's. Um yes. that, we Old have Old Man Joe, Joseph Joe Star from Battle Tendencies returning, fifty years older, looking gray haired and essentially the same. <laughs> So Ray-haired I, and bearded. I, I, <laughs> and bearded. I, I admit it took me a full episode to realize it was the same person from last season. And then I was like, like, I, I turned to David and I said, damn, Grandpa's got a nice butt. And David's like, it's Joseph from last season. I was like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> because the, in the opening, there is a shot of, of all five of our eventual main characters walking away from the camera and they're all just swaggering and Joseph is wearing incredibly tight pants. I would argue that there are actually a lot more shots of his butt than you remember. Like, once I started I'm paying s- attention, I was like, someone put effort into this. Like, <laughs> yeah, he never skips squats. <laughs> he's, he's doing leg day every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I found it weird because obviously he's not the character that you are supposed to be uh, conventionally attracted to this season. But I don't know, for me. <laughs> I mean, that that is a, uh, there is a significant genre of old guy BL, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. But there's probably more than a few people who saw this and like read the manga and went, I ho- hope this doesn't awaken something in me. <laughs> I'm gonna go draw some doujinshi now. <laughs> the accepting you're like, oh, daddy. 
<laughs> the accepted way of dealing with these feelings. Fan art. Um, <laughs> um No, but I'm I'm glad they didn't just drop the ham on stuff completely because you know, they were explaining the stands and I was like, oh, so they're just gonna just gonna throw in a completely new magic system and forget the old one. But no, um, Joseph actually does yeah. use his ripple abilities a few times. So because jo- yeah, <laughs> and Joseph- he explicitly mentions things that happened to him in the last season. Yeah, so. <laughs> like his stand is pretty much the only one that's that's not a combat related thing. And so when he's in his fighting, he's still using his hamon, his ripple powers. Yep. <laughs> and- uh- his robot hand is a plot point a number of times. Uh, <laughs> special hand, I should say. Prosthetic. <laughs> prosthetic yeah. hand. Uh, this also probably has, like, the most, like, critical mass of music references than any other season to date. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's nonstop. I love it. <laughs> um, like, not just with, like, main, not just with, like, like, antagonists, but, like, major characters, like, um, Polnareff is named after a French musician who apparently is fully aware of JoJo's and is like, yeah, I'm all into it. Like, he took, put, posted a picture on his Twitter of, like, uh, photoshopped um, Polnareff's face with uh, his signature sunglasses on it. Yes. <laughs> I gotta know, did he watch it? Because Polnareff is, like, to all of an ex- to an extent, God, Polnareff. Polnareff is... <laughs> He's big himbo a energy. Functional idiot. <laughs> he has big himbo energy. Oh my god! Like, like Joseph is very much pure of heart, dumb of ass, <laughs> and Polnareff is just dumb of all. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I don't like, it, but that's come on, the thing man. is that Pol- <laughs> like Polnareff keeps walking into issues. Like, hey, what was that? I'm gonna go investigate by myself. So Polnareff, and he doesn't learn his lesson. He does this multiple times. Polnareff gets a lot of focus over the course of this season. And um, my emotions went like the full 360 for him. Like I started off like, okay, this guy's kind of weird, but he's all right. I like him too. Wow. I really like this guy too. Wow. This guy is really dumb too. What the hell, Polnareff? Come on. And then they started to make a joke out of the fact that he was so dumb and everyone else in the party knew it. And I went fully right back around to, okay, I love this guy again because he's just the butt of the joke now. (laughs) I do not want to give any sort of, you know, spoilers away because there is something related to Polnareff uh, about midway through the season. And everyone after that just is just neglects to mention vital information to him. Because they know he can't keep his mouth closed. <laughs> so clearly, Polderef need if we do if this does get a live action adaptation, Polderef must be played by Tom Holland. For for the yeah, um, I could see that. that yeah, you know, not, not because he's big. Tom Holland is big and muscular, but, be, but, but because as the, Tom Holland cannot keep a secret to save his life. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> God, you can just look at all the interviews where Tom Holland realizes he said the wrong thing. And his like co-star is trying to you know cover up. And he's just, oh, God, <laughs> not again. <laughs> Several times, Polder F is like, why does this always happen to me? And it's like, because you dumb, honey. <laughs> <laughs> why do I always get ambushed in the bathroom? <laughs> I think I think Poldreff had my favorite line out of the entire thing, which was, holy shit, we got zombies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the season also sets up what I look as the like the most literal and figurative bathroom humor of all the other Jojo of, of JoJo's to date as well. Big yes. time. <laughs> yeah. But there are yes, but there are five main characters. Uh Joseph. Um Returning from last season. A.K.A. Hot Grandpa. Uh, the new Jojo is his grandson, uh, J- uh, Jotaro Kujo. A.K.A. the hot brooding one that everyone likes to cosplay as. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's also a uh, transfer student to uh, Jotaro's school, Kakyoin. 
I don't have a cute nickname for him. <laughs> the problem is, is that while he was important at the beginning, he kind of just became almost just a background character. And by the end, he's just doing things with a stand that someone else is already doing. Yeah. Although he did, he did get that great bit with the whole Dream Warriors thing, and he was like, he mentions it to the party, and because none of them remember it, they're like, wait, what? And he's like, oh yeah, you guys don't remember that. <laughs> yep. Like, I like him, but he, he, he definitely got the least amount of characterization. Disagree. Jotaro. We know nothing about this guy. Yeah. Nothing. Like, except go- that he... He He's, the new, That's it. He's <laughs> the new Jojo. That's it. He's the new Jojo. That's his character. Jojo, like that, and his divining character trait is juvenile delinquent. Uh, because I think juvenile delinquent manga was like a big thing at this point. Um, yeah. With, with yes, I, I will say with Jotaro. And yet we see him going to school. <laughs> well, that's the thing. The delinquents go to the school. They just don't pay attention at the school. Although, I mean, his hat hair, and I have to say it that way. Because it is unclear where his hat ends and his hair begins, it's and like vice versa. It's literally drawn with the same outline. I can't, I can't tell what's hair and what's hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, his character, if you know the juvenile delinquent tropes, they do fill in a lot of the missing information. So my favorite example of the juvenile delinquent trope in anime is... Um, Kuwabara. Kuwabara, yeah. <laughs> From... Yu Yu Hakusho. Thank you. I'm bad with names. And um, he was hilarious because he, everyone thought of him as this tough guy thug, and yet he was just a marshmallow. Yeah. I I think Jotaro, they're trying to position as very much just the, like, the angsty bad boy who is secretly good-hearted. And it's like, but it's not so secret. You know, he, he, he doesn't really make a... I mean, in, in the a, fact that he's generally a good person. <laughs> I mean, in a lot of the delinquent manga, they do like they have the character who plays that straight. Like before, I'd watched this. I'd what I'd read. I think this is a later manga when it came out, but it's in the juvenile delinquent genre. Um, Crows, um, which has it's a full on straight juvenile delinquent manga battle manga, um, and like the main characters and like a bunch of the main characters that are that. He, they're, they present as a very like aggressively masculine tough guy, but secretly they're a big marshmallow at heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, like that's a that's a big significant part of that genre. So it is definitely a case of using genre tropes to kind of fill in a little bit around the characterization. Mm-hmm. Um, so speaking of of, of uh, Kujo and Kakuin, um, this reminds me. So like one of the big sh- like fanfic doujinshi that came out of this. Like one of the most famous ones is Clamp did a like one of their earliest doujinshis was of um, Kakoin and Jotaro and um, Jotaro in a relationship together, raising an egg baby as in a baby that hatched from an egg. Is there any like I didn't I I, I, went, <laughs> I I knew about that going in, so I'm like I'm looking for the subtext that would fuel that sort of shipping, and I didn't see it. I don't know if either. I, like I gotta say, not really. I think outside of the episode where they meet and they are like for five, ten seconds in school together, I didn't. I didn't really see it either. I mean, they usually. I mean, the two of them do whenever they're like at staying at a hotel because it is a road trip. The two of them do share a room together. There is that, and but I think that was just because. Oh yeah, we're the students, so it makes sense for us to room together for the students who are going to wear our school uniforms even into the sahara desert because that's how we do also when jotaro's uh jacket is destroyed he is able to get a replacement jacket from a local bazaar uh, exactly. the local tailor he, he, the lo- he has yeah. that's right. the local <laughs> tailor who has it custom made in like 20 minutes <laughs> Uh, and even gets the enormous gold ring he keeps in the collar and i'm like wow that I mean, is it's entirely possible it's entirely possible that he retrieves the gold ring in the collar <laughs> and, and from ring and chain um for a hole in the collar right here and the tailor's like why <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's for this like oh okay i can I, I could probably do some like stitching and anchoring to make it fit in better like, this must be that uniform modding that i've heard so much about <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, oh, and the fifth character is 
our Egyptian native Avdol, who is a tarot reader, which he says is very important at times, but he mostly exists to be Mr. Exposition. And set things on fire, because his yes. stand is um, Magician's Red, which is basically burn things. Yes. Um, uh, worth noting is uh, all the stands are named after Major Arcana from the tarot. And I would like to talk about that, because I have read tarot since I was like 15 years old. <laughs> I, this is a good time to get into that, because we, um, we have like... Like, like literally everybody and somehow has their major arcana. They do try to talk about a little bit about what that card, the card means in the show. Um, and so it's good to know, like, no, yes. like, do they get it right? So as someone who has been reading tarot cards for decades now, um, let me just say up front that I have no religious attachment to the tarot. Like it, it it's just semiotics and symbology, right? And the tarot that most people use nowadays was uh, co-opted indigenous tradition by a bunch of old white guys who then started a bunch of mystic societies and thought they were real cool. So to hell with those guys. So I, <laughs> I have no skin in the game is what I'm trying to say. But in terms of the generally accepted symbologies for the major arcana and their associated meanings, I would give the show like a, f a four out of ten. <laughs> And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, they get the broad strokes fine. As a tarot reader, by the time I got to the end of the season, it was I incredibly obvious to me what Dio's stand is going to be named. And I won't say it, but it, it became extremely obvious the longer we went on. Um, and I was, <laughs> like, I was asking myself questions like, are they going to do strength and temperance and justice are they gonna do all yes. 22 cards like and i mean essentially they they kind of did which was <laughs> yeah which was fine um but in terms of nailing down the meanings behind the cards eh, they got just kind of the broadest strokes of it right and the rest was just clearly an excuse for some really fun designs and crazy shenanigans and that's not bad <laughs> like i don't mind uh indeed um big of shenanigans like i like that how like they're like from the first episode onward they do set up pretty clearly here's how we're going to be doing the conflicts in this show because we have oh with, with, with jotaro having having manifested his stand not knowing what it is and deciding okay to protect myself and not to protect other people from myself, I'm going to lock myself up in prison. Uh, Which is really interesting from the status of that um, juvenile delinquent trope, right? <laughs> yep. And uh, eventually, when he gets out of prison, it's through um, um, Joe Star, uh, Joseph Joe Star, basically asking uh, Muhammad Abdul to get him out of can you get him out of his cell? And the the way. Abdul wins the fight is not by beating up um, Jotaro and knocking him out, dragging him out, but provoking him into walking out of the cell of his own accord. In order to and, fight him. <laughs> yeah. And at which point he then stops the fight and says, well, he's like, you bet I couldn't get you to leave your cell. Here you go. Um, and, <laughs> I win. <laughs> and it sets up the, like, a lot of how these fights work out, which is it's not direct physical confrontations like what we had with ripple and that sort of thing before it is much more um a battle of wits with characters um feeling out each other's stands trying to find their weaknesses and then in a lot of cases provoking their opponent to putting themselves into a situation where they are vulnerable and can and that weakness can be exploited yeah uh they mostly avoid the previous seasons um tendency during combat which i got really frustrated with to be like i knew you were going to do that well i knew that you knew that i was going to do that and on and on and on and on instead it becomes more of a a, a two-step process where first they have to figure out what the enemy stands powers are and then they have to figure out a way to circumvent them to defeat it and sometimes 
they are combating the actual stand and sometimes they're going after the stand's users. So there's additional levels of complexity and additional players on the board that keep things moving and keep things very interesting. Which I appreciated. Mm -hmm. It also lets them get into a lot more like, I mean, the first two seasons had various degrees of horror film references to them, especially season one. Uh, But this also lets them get into like a broader array of horror film stuff here too. Um, some of it's a lot of different references. Like some of it is like a very like campy horror comedy, evil dead to Sam Raimi kind of thing. Um, where like, for example, when, um, Polnareff is in the bathroom and he ends up getting controlled, (laughs) uh, and having to lick clean a toilet. Uh, it's, it, it is both, it is both comedy and it is both horrifying, uh, which is like kind of thing where it's like, Oh, like, if you've seen Evil Dead 2, like there's a big chunk of there's a chunk of that movie that's an extended riff on the Three Stooges short of Plumbing We Will Go, except with um, um, uh, Ash played by Bruce Campbell in the basement, like dealing with pipes it that is, are except, yeah, spew, it's very it, Evil Dead. <laughs> except instead of spewing out water in, in Evil Dead 2, they're spewing out blood. So on the one hand, it's hilarious. Cause it's a three. It's a very clear Three Stooges riff, complete with Bruce Campbell doing the oh a wise guy eh at the pipes. Uh, but the other hand, it's horrifying because he's getting doused in blood in the same, and the same sort of thing here with some stuff with particularly Polderef. Like oh, if it wasn't this poor guy, <laughs> like, like on the other hand with Polderef, like if you don't get um, Tom Holland to play him, um, grab, <laughs> like go back in time, grab early, early to late eighties, Bruce Campbell <laughs> That would be magical. Um, I think I think the most egregious horror movie reference was there was a, a shower scene a la Psycho in the episode where they fought the strength stand. And uh, I had I had some issues with that episode. Um, and I, I could see where they were going. I could see the references they were making. But for a time, the party is followed by this young girl character who is portrayed very much as like a young street urchin. We think it's a boy at first. It turns out it's a girl. That's all fine. No problems. But then in order to pull off this reference to Psycho, all of a sudden she becomes very sexualized. And it's very uncomfortable, honestly. Um, (laughs) Because just like five minutes ago, it was just a child. Right? So. <laughs> Once again, Japan, I implore you, stop showing me naked little girls! <laughs> please, please don't and, do that, Japan. And the thing is, as only as this one episode, they never do yeah. it again. It's just that one thing, and it was like almost solely just to pull off this psycho reference. But, oh, yeah, I don't know. It just it threw me out of it, you know? <laughs> yeah, like they never, like, like, they never do it again. Like, it, it, any other character. Any other female character where, where they have a character, uh, any other female character that um, Polnareff, it's always Polnareff, um, always is, Polnareff. Uh, it ends up flirting with or being romantically interested in um, is always signif- is much older in age. In fact, none of the cast has any <laughs> romantic interest in the street urchin um, and ever. Yeah. Um, Everything else about her is fine. It's just in this one episode to pull off this reference, she becomes explicitly sexualized and leered at by a literal ape. So I feel like that was a misstep. Out of the yep. whole season, that's the one thing that I would be like, change that. I'm like, <laughs> yep. Um, see what other um, what's like and like, a, we have lots and lots more um. Uh, references to uh, other uh, musicians here. Um, some of them, uh, actually, I will say, like, I'm going to give some shout outs to the localization here because in some cases they made decisions which I think were replacing one reference for another for another one, which I think actually worked better. Um, so, like, a good example is um, there's the character. Uh, in the Japanese, virtual Japanese version, his name is uh, Devo. Um, and they changed his name to Soul Sacrifice. I'm like, that's actually good because you're, because you have your villain, De- so you have this lesser villain, Devo, but you also have your main big bad, 
Dio, your names sound mm-hmm. kind of similar, and if you're giving characters um, accents as well, that ain't helping. So, props there. <laughs> um, Speaking of, of accents, it is only very rarely that Polnareff remembers he's French. <laughs> Specifically when he's cursing. <laughs> oh, you I, get occasional I, merde, uh, mon dieu. Oh, that reminds yeah. me, I, I watched this um, subtitled so I could get the the differences between the, the um, localized names. Um, how was the dub? I didn't mind it. Entertaining. It was entertaining. My uh, Joseph remains my favorite because he would just occasionally, like at least once an episode, he'd be like, oh no! Oh my god! Oh my god! So, so that, oh that, shit! So that's in the Japanese version too. Yes, and, it, and I love it. I love it so much. And, and, and in the Japanese version, it's it's also him doing it in English. Um, yeah. and whereas because he's English, um, or American. Right? No, no, no. Joseph is English. Yep. Yes, he could. The... Oh, I thought he was from America though. He so he. Was... he yeah, his family's from England, he the grew UK. Up in America, right? No, no, no. He grew up with his grandmother in England. They went. They visited <laughs> New York to see Speedwagon. Okay, okay, okay. And that's how gotcha. Battle Tendency got its start. <laughs> um, and, it's just uh, the fact that no one has ever tried to make him sound British. I thought the family moved to America. That was my bad. <laughs> uh, also, props to the voice cast for. Um, I, I just call that English cast. So we've got some big names here. Um, Jotaro is Matt Mercer, Mercer's Dungeon Master great. himself. Mercer is great, but honestly, he was given so little to work with. Like, he's supposed to be the JoJo of the series, but, like, <laughs> he's he's also the flattest character. Well, again, we didn't really get a lot of characterization for Jojo, mm-hmm. and I really enjoyed having two JoJos in the same party, but I do think that next to Joseph's, like, over-the-top energy, yeah. Jotaro does get sidelined a little bit, because he's more of the strong, silent type. <laughs> that and... Well, actually, we're talking about the dub, so... I Yeah, I don't, I don't have any problems with the dub. Uh, it felt almost, like... This isn't because of the dub, but it's, you know, it's the series. It felt very exaggerated. It almost felt like those abridged videos version of itself... And that how over the top it was, but that's just JoJo. It's just the show, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see who else we have. Um, so I can actually, um, Joseph is vo- um, old. Um, Joseph is voiced by uh, Richard Epcar. Yes, um, <laughs> yep, who also is Bato, um, and is the current English dub voice for Dice Gay Jigen. I see it. <laughs> so, so I guess he is now officially our badass old man voice actor. Heck for yeah. English dubs. <laughs> He's been the badass old man since like the early two thousands. Fair. Uh, um, but yeah. But honestly, like my biggest complaint with the season is the fact that Joseph doesn't get those. That's what you were going to say moments like you did before. And that makes sense. He's not the main character. He's not having to outsmart anything. But he keeps being surprised by things. And I'm like, dude, he used to be able to see everything. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yet I feel like he takes up just a lot of space. Like his presence takes up so much space in the narrative. Yeah. Like, and I like that because I like him, but well, he is the driving force. There is an argument that could be made that it's like, to the detriment of the current Jojo, Jojo. Yeah. <laughs> like Joseph is the driving force of the narrative or driving character of the narrative because it's his quest to save his daughter who just who is also Jotaro's mother. And He's gra- and he's picked up these people along the way to stop Dio. They've got skin in the game because Holly is at risk. Yeah. Um, Abdal has skin in the game because Dio tried to recruit him and or perhaps kill him. It was unclear. Um, Kakuin yeah. has skin in the game because he was like mind, mind raped by Dio. <laughs> and Polnareff has skin in the game because his sister was killed by one of Dio's minions. Yes. The man with two right hands! <laughs> Which is an interesting reference that I like. Uh, I, I, <laughs> and then we also see that this guy's mom also has two right hands. It's just never commented on. 
Uh, nice little through line there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I actually, with the um, uh, Joe's getting fooled by things, like, that particular actually ties into another one of the, the good localization fixes. Um, so, in the jet in the original Japanese version, the um, on one of the first boats they try to take, um, <laughs> um, which the captain has allegedly been vetted by the Speedwagon Foundation, but it turns out has secretly been replaced by one of Dio's minions. Um, in the Japanese version, his name is Captain Tenniel. Um, in the in the English version, they change it to Captain Dragon, which works. Because that is the actual name of the captain from Captain and Tennille. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's... I love it. I love it when the localization team thinks about things and takes care with it. <laughs> that's always good. I, I liked that bait and switch, too, when they found out that, uh, uh, uh-oh, <laughs> there's a stand user on this boat. Actually, the whole season is full of moments when they're like, okay, we can finally relax for a minute. Uh-oh! There's oh, an no. enemy! <laughs> oh no! Bullruff's been attacked in the bathroom! Uh -oh. Again! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> just constantly, they're constantly, it, it's just never ending. And, um, so the, the fact that there are 22 major Arcana cards means that this does start to drag a little bit at least for me um th there there are only so many times they can pull that trick for uh, me they kind of saved it at the end of the season with a couple of big reveals that i really enjoyed um <laughs> wow everywhere you stop the bad guys are already there plotting to kill you it's like they know where you're going <laughs> It's not just they know where you're going, it's they know where you're going and exactly how you're going there, despite the fact that you faked this guy. No, that was it. Despite the fact that you secretly purchased this thing without any connection to yourself. Oh, they actually do kind of establish this a little bit by saying that, um, um, <laughs> That, that um, Dio is able to, every time Joseph uses power to see him, Dio can see Joseph right back. Yep. Yeah. Um, so they do, do a bit of like, okay, they have a bit of a, a psychic link going on of, due to, uh, it's worth to mention here, uh, Dio, ha the explanation why Dio is around, Dio's dissevered head has managed to, like, at, at some point after the conclusion of um, Phantom Blood, claim the body of Jonathan Joestar. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why he's up and walking around again, and is not a Futurama-esque brain ahead in a jar. Um, which I think would have been an entirely different, amazing storyline. <laughs> yeah, they could have made that work, but yeah, absolutely, vampire head in a jar <laughs> on a robot <laughs> body—that would be no less ridiculous than what we've gotten. <laughs> The, the the minor theme of body horror is still strong in this season. There are a couple there are a couple great body horror moments. Uh, aside from Dio. The the whole flesh bulb concept that he implants his cells into people to mind control them. The justice card. The justice card. Um <laughs> There there was even like a See, I think of it as a magic school bus reference, but I don't know if everybody will get it. But it's it's like a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids reference where they have to get really small and go into someone's body. <laughs> That's incredible journey. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. My references might not be the same as your references. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, yeah, I think that I think we've established that shrinking down and going into somebody's body is something that's been covered a lot. It's been covered, but yeah, it was fun. Yep. It was uh, silly. Everything was silly and fun. Yes, that, that's JoJo. Everything is silly and fun and horrifying. Yeah, and horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, we've talked a very about some, uh, the stand so far. What were some of your favorite stand battles um, from this season? I actually... This probably would not be the one a lot of people would pick, but I liked the episode with the sun. Uh, because it... <laughs> It, it was almost like it was just different from all the other stand battles in that, yes, it's a stand, but it's also, we're just killing you with an environmental effect at this point. 
The, there's there's nothing you can fight. It's just the literal heat is killing you. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. If I look at the season in terms of a dungeon master with a campaign, it makes so much sense to me, a lot of the choices that were made. And so this is something that I would have tried to pull if like, I'd had a party that had gone through a bunch of like physical battles or mental puzzles. I would have been like, what can I do that's different from that? I know. We'll just try and kill them with the environment, you know? <laughs> and they did have to kind of think their way out of it. But I, I don't know. I kind of, I, I liked that change of pace, I guess, is what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, I honestly kind of liked the strength because oh. his stand was a ship that they were in. <laughs> And he had complete control over the... Okay, once again, it's the environment they're fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there also was just a... Just a like, yeah, just a, a gigantic a, ape. A gross physical antagonist. Uh, a uh, ring <laughs> Nothing against our Simeon cousins, but that character was gross. <laughs> yes. As was hopefully the intent. <laughs> um, I... I also did like the the Dream Warriors episode where Kakuin kind of took point. That was, it was also kind of, I also liked it because at this point in the season, I was looking for a change of pace and it was, it was really cool how like no one else was picking up on the things that he was picking up on. And so it created a little tension in the group briefly. I don't know. I liked that. Um, I I didn't like the design of the baby, but uh, yeah. It's an evil baby. There is no way to make that design good. <laughs> like, you can make that design compelling, you can make that design horrifying, but you can't make it appealing because I it's an evil the... baby. <laughs> the, the faces they were given that thing. <laughs> I liked um, when we had the team up fight um, between uh, Jay Guile and. Um, I forget what the what his um, English for ver- English version was, um, and which was uh, his power? That was the um, mirror one. Um, uh, the hanged man, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. hanged man. Um, so I'm trying to remember the exact name of the um, the puppet guy. Yeah, uh, so, so, so it was um, the Emperor and Hanged Man was the fu- was the team up fight. It was um, it was the gunslinger. Oh, yeah. whole horse and, and centerfold guy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, whole horse and centerfold. Yes, um, it's like that team up fight was really good. Um, yeah, honestly, I I kind of loved the fact that these are two guys who are on the same side, very clearly don't like each other, but they're being friendly, <laughs> strained allies. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, they're really good at work at you know putting their advantages together. So good at doing it, in fact, that when Whole Horse realized that Centerfold wasn't backing him up anymore, he just skedaddled. <laughs> <laughs> I also liked the episode with um, uh, Steely Dan, which I believe they uh, relocalized as <laughs> Rubber Soul. Dan of Steel. Dan, Dan of Steel. Of, yeah, sorry, the, the Dan of Steel. <laughs> Um, I was like, really? <laughs> yeah. like that, I, I know exactly where they're coming from, and that is an amazing change Hell to yeah. make. <laughs> um, and like they that was, a, yeah, they did a like, great job making him a loathsome creature. Like, like, <laughs> I, I, also, I loved the introduction. Like, before we actually get to the character himself, himself which is with the. We're going to take a break from the main story to introduce our Shonen Jump audience to the concept of haggling. <laughs> yes! <laughs> let's give an explainer! <laughs> you know, I, I don't feel qualified to comment on the quality of the information that they presented about the countries that the party traveled through. And the representation And the was... representation therein. But, um... How do I put this? I'm glad that they tried, I guess, to present information about these these different areas so that the audience wouldn't be like, wow, what is... I what? mean, they, <laughs> I think they did a great job in stepping beyond the stereotypes. 
for the Or at least most trying to. <laughs> yeah. Um, they tried to make things not just the stereotypes. Yeah, and and when and they they had the they were willing to be somewhat self depreciating in terms of having like Polnareff and um Joseph be basically the ugly European tourist. Yes. Uh, and there's this kind of implication that Joseph was used to being the rich white tourist guy, which I could totally see for him. Well, anywhere he goes. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it we see, you know, Joseph is putting on this over-the-top act. That's true. He leans into it. Because, you know, people expect this of him, so he is. So that that was, that to me felt very much like the Joseph from... Uh, battle tendency yes. is that he's people are expecting him to do this so he's going to do this he's going to play into their expectations while looking for his own advantage this does lead to an amazing joke where he confidently leads them to trade for a bunch of camels and then he's like alright it's time to ride these camels and the entire time we're thinking he knows exactly what he's doing and then he's like they're like have you ever actually ridden a camel and he goes I've watched Lords of Arabia like three times. How hard could it be? <laughs> <laughs> which, 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 which fits into the um, all the other running like similar running jokes of like, oh yeah, I've I've flown uh, four like three or four planes. Crash! I've also crash. crashed. <laughs> I loved how Joe Trio kept giving Joseph a hard time about transport because yeah, it's fair. It's a fair reading. If you crash the submarine, I'm never getting into another vehicle with you again. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> uh, it's good. It's good. <laughs> I, I think in in terms of representing these different cultures. Their stay in India made me the most uncomfortable. But I'm not convinced that it was inaccurate. Like, I know it was cringy and bad. But I also know that that kind of behavior does happen, particularly around rich white tourists. So at risk of sounding like a jerk... Like, uh, ugh, it made me uncomfortable, but I was also kind of like, yeah, I could see that happening. I, I, I mean, I have <clears throat> had friends who have traveled and have had that happen to them. Yeah. 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 I, I could see this being a case of like. Just productive. Like, yeah. Of, of like Iraqi going on a scouting trip to some of these areas that he's thinking about covering, not necessarily the border of India and Pakistan. But that would like, have been a bad place to go visit. Yes, especially, especially in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, especially in the eighties. But like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to like some of the, like, I'm gonna go to Singapore. I'm gonna go to Hong Kong. I'm gonna go to a couple of the major cities in uh, India. And having these experiences with, oh, he's a rich in this case Japanese in the middle of the bubble economy tourist. Mm -hmm. Um, and go and go. Okay, I, this is what I'm going to put into the story. Um. And not necessarily critically examining the circumstances around that, because yeah, in retro, because like in a with the author who was looking more into that, like particularly with the case of somebody like Abdul, who was often trying to portray a more a nuanced depiction of areas in question. Mm -hmm. This would have been a situation for to have that information coming from Abdul, or like no, of this is what you're seeing. Because you're a rich white, because you're a rich foreign tourist. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> to be fair, I did get that sense. Like these these people are pegged for certain behaviors because of the way they present themselves. This isn't everybody in that country by any means. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it just becomes a problem because it feels a little reductive, um, especially if they spend more than an episode in that country. <laughs> yeah. I, particularly in, the, in in some of the cases where we're getting well, or because of the manners of travel in which our uh, protagonists are going, they're going well off of the beaten track of where the tourists would normally go. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um. So other and um. So that pretty much covers. Also, we need to talk about the ending song, because uh, <laughs> because we're used. They're. 
in the first season, we already they had a steady integration of Roundabout by Yes into the show. And mm -hmm. they did an interesting job of using different portions of the song depending on the emotional situation of where each episode wrapped up at. Using like the guitar intro to provoke a sense of mystery, using like one of the more big solos to to create a sense of um, triumphant success or that sort of thing. Here we're using Walk Like an Egyptian by the Bangles. And it doesn't have that necessary emotional range to it. I mean, you're kind of going from pop rock, from a uh, prog rock to pop rock in this regard. And so we're just kind of using the same portion of the song. Not, not just kind of, we are using the same portion of the song <coughs> in every episode, no matter where it ends, no matter where emotionally that episode ends. So, like at the start of the show, it worked. It like when they first use it, actually at the end of episode two, and introduce that. Like that was a really strong emotional and visual beat. But at other portions of the show, it didn't quite hit the same way for me because of the the context. I wonder how what you thought. Yeah, no, there were a lot of points where it was you know we're ending on a very emotional note due to you know a death or you know a triumphant moment and then just into walk like an egyptian and it's like that's kind of a clash so i i really enjoy that song it's a bop but i'm fully aware that it plays into cultural stereotypes of people in you know northern africa arabia the middle east and i think it fits the show really well and i also think that's kind of a bummer because the combination of using this song, of using the tarot, of using Around the World in 80 Days, it, it just is very, like, early 20th century colonialism to me. It's like you got... I know they aren't all white people, okay, I get that, but the feeling it gives me is white people going out and being like, look at all these fun, foreign, exotic things without being willing to engage with that on a deeper level and confront their prejudices about what that means. And <laughs> the whole history of the tarot is that um, <laughs> a lot of tourism in countries like India and places like Singapore grew out of that white colonialist kind, colonialist kind of mindset. And then the song... And again, I like the song. It's just, it is taking all of these stereotypes about Egyptians and putting them into a package meant to be easily consumed by Western culture in this, hey, here's a fun foreign thing kind of way. And I f that, that feeling kind of permeates the season for me, despite Avdol's presence. Um... And even though I really enjoyed the show, I couldn't not think about that critically, as it were. <laughs> I feel like that was, it's just kind of a constant underpinning in the back of my awareness of what was going on. Again, this is a really fun, silly, wacky, crazy show. <laughs> but I also think you have to look critically at your media, especially the media that you like, and just be aware of these things. Yeah, like I, I do get a sense of like why this song was picked, of because with Roundabout it was contemporaneous with when those volumes of the manga were published, and I get the sense they're 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 picking songs from the eras that the much of the manga came out, so they're going okay, what's a hit song from the '80s that was a, like from the international hit song, like from this period, oh. So they're like going down a list like, oh, walk like an Egyptian. We're going to Egypt. There we go. And they didn't necessarily examine much further than that. For and, and there's like I there's probably some other songs that honestly that they could have picked that I think would have worked better. I can't necessarily think of one off the top of my head. Um but I would have appreciated going with like like finding something that also that one didn't necessarily have that sense of colonialism, but also Having watched the whole season and having and having had that context from what from rewatching um, season one right before this of being able to have something that has that emotional breadth to it mm -hmm. um, that lets you to like pick and choose portions for your closing credits 
to fit where your episode ends would have been a better choice. Yes, I agree. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the vibe of Walk Like an Egyptian is is kind of fun and, and easy and playful, and it matches with a lot of the show. Um, I actually feel like in the show, when they did try to have big emotional moments, a lot of the times it was being undercut by not even the ridiculousness of the scenario, but by... Oh, God, I don't even know how to put this in proper, like, filmmaking terms, but just the overall vibe of the show was we are, we're on a, a fun road trip with a bunch of wacky characters and we're moving on from whatever consequences we create. So even when they try and have a big... Tonal inconsistency. ...character moment, like, I'm thinking specifically here of when Polnareff's sister is resurrected from the dead as a horrifying thing. It's still not hitting really deeply emotionally for me because of all of the wackiness surrounding it. Okay, that yeah, <laughs> I think okay that that one in particular, I think we were supposed to because to me it was hitting very much Evil Dead. It was comedic in a way. Yeah, very much yeah. Evil Dead or Evil Dead Two, I should say. Yeah, yeah, because Evil Dead Two is the one where they have Ash's girlfriend as a animated deadite mocking and taunting him repeatedly over the first half of the story. Yeah, I mean, to me, when this happened, I was like, oh. And also oh, because it yeah. was Polnareff, I was already primed to be laughing, if that makes sense. Yeah, because Polnareff is never taken seriously. <laughs> Even though he has arguably the most, like, Intent. his tragic backstory is the most focused on. Well, that's the, pr I mean, that was the <laughs> thing, is that he was very serious and then he got his revenge for his little sister, and at that point, he became an utter joke. He didn't really take anything seriously. He was like, oh, I accomplished my life goal, might as well enjoy the ride. This actually, yeah. this plays into something I wanted to say kind of near the end was, I know that for a lot of people, Stardust Crusaders is their favorite arc, right? I've, I've seen mm -hmm. that over and over. And I think part of that is because America got Stardust Crusaders in that earlier adaptation. And so it was maybe the first JoJo that they saw. And I think part of it is, yeah, it is so much fun having these wacky characters on a, on a road trip together. Well, but, another part of... Uh, oh. But for me, I actually feel like last season was stronger in terms of setup, payoff, consequences, emotional beats, landing. Yeah. This season just felt a little... Um, it almost became formulaic, although I think they just kind of narrowly avoided that. Eh, and I don't think they avoided it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like every episode had the same uh, layout. But, I mean, it had the same basic premise. A stand user shows up, we have to defeat it and move on. Mm -hmm. But the emotional beats just didn't hit for me like last season's did. And Actually, they did not reinforce it with the ending song, as you pointed out. Let me check something real quick. I just had a thought of what the song... All right. Well, I was going to say, one of the reasons that Stardust Crusaders is became so much bigger than the others is because it had something the others really didn't, which was the ability to self-insert. You could create your own stand, your stand sonas, as it were which we've seen as hugely popular all that. over the places. And that ability to say, oh, yeah, that's cool. So mine would be this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like we've seen that with, you know, fursonas, gemsonas, what have you. Yep. Spirit animals, although that Issues. calling it that is Issues. just right out. <laughs> um, Patronuses. Patronuses. Yeah, I get that. I get yeah. that. That's one of the huge... Re that's one of the reasons Star Wars Crusaders did get so big was because it would have a lot more... Fan involvement. Exactly. Uh, so I had a thought for what they could have done for their next song for the um, um, for the close credit song, but that was but that song was seventy, so it wouldn't work. Uh, I was I was going to do "Carry On My Wayward Son" by Kansas, which also in a weird way actually kind of fits thematically with. I think that one would actually, have been yeah, better. That would have worked, yeah, yeah, yeah I could, because, see that. because I had this moment of like, wait a minute. We're talking about what this is and like how it is somewhat formulaic. You have your monster of the week, but it's handled in a different way and you're doing investigation. I'm going, wait a minute. This is supernatural. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah, you're right. Oh my god. <laughs> it is instead of bombing around um 
British Columbia as surrogate for the American Midwest um, in they a... They look so much alike. Um, <laughs> in a... Um, in a Chevy Impala, it is in taking a variety of vehicles which are frequently destroyed in the... Yep, in the frequently uh, destroyed. In, frequently, always. They are <laughs> always destroyed. Uh, Joseph uh, cannot, sur- cannot get on a vehicle without it exploding, sinking, crashing, or multiple of the above. I mean, yeah, some, of the cars that Polnareff, some of the cars that Polnareff... Some of the cars that drives... Get like... So, I mean, this this is. I mean, to be fair, this is um, a Iraqi manga. Animals will be harmed in the making. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like that is like that is like the stock content warning for Iraqi on a manga is animals are going to be harmed. <laughs> um, but like, I think a couple of the cars Polnareff drives does survive do survive for another for like a, an episode or two before they are destroyed. Lifespan slightly longer than average. <laughs> <laughs> Buildings um, in there also tend to be destroyed. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's a five-man wrecking crew. Yeah, but yeah, like it has that sense of like soup of the TV so supernatural, where you have characters Very bombing nice. around, fighting their instead of the ghost of the week or demon of the week, it's the stand wielder of the week. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can only agree with that up to a certain point because uh, I did not finish all 15 seasons of Supernatural. <laughs> to be fair, neither did I. Like we like, like but of what I did saw, yes, absolutely, but it could have changed. <laughs> they could have go- they could have gone off formula. I mean, I watched more of that than I wish I had. <laughs> what, seven seasons? Of it? And by then it was like why are we still doing this to ourselves? <laughs> I mean, from what I understand, at some point, even the actors and the writers are going, why are we still doing this? Oh, what's that, what's that truck backing up sound? Oh, that's the CW with a with another car, truck full of money. That's yep. why we're still yep, doing yep. this. Um, but, uh, no, yeah. That is an excellent point. <laughs> like, I, 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 and I think, like, for that matter, one of the things that, so we're seeing we're seeing with JoJo's that makes this work that that helps them avoid the problem that Supernatural had is because this is ultimately something of a multi generational thing. Mm-hmm. Um, is you are you will have the opportunity to go okay um, next season we're going to keep things fresh and we're going to remove one JoJo or we're going to add a JoJo to the plot um, and shuffle up the supporting cast significantly. Um, and honestly, I think with the addition of stands, we're getting the opportunity to do that further because since stands have such a wide array of uh, powers and abilities that they can do, it avoids the problem with Ripple of how are we solving this? We are solving this by punching because everyone's special ability is punch. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I I will say that the character designs for the stands... They really took me back to watching Sailor Moon as a young woman and the monsters of the week. Yes. Like the insane designs. <laughs> How wacky can we make it? Pretty wacky, as it turns out. <laughs> there are, the, like, some of them reminded me of Dragon Ball Z villains. A lot of them reminded me of the Sailor Moon monsters of the week. Some of them were, like, horror references. Uh, so it's clear that... There was some fun had there. <laughs> and it's good. It, it's it's always good to find things that keep you engaged and interested in what you're drawing. Or bad things happen, as we have seen. <laughs> what was your oh. favorite design? Hmm, that's tricky. Right? Uh, <laughs> like, I... Um... Like the boat, kind of for strength, was like really good. Like I actually went, went when when the boat came up. I'm like, had the movie Ghost Ship come out at this point? And I, like, I had to go look at my no, the Ghost Ship came out in the two thousands. But I was like, because like like the concept, of not just the environment is a hazard, but like this almost um, cube esque thing of the environment itself finding ways to kill people and that yeah. sort of thing. Um, and yeah. like, uh, I like Hierophant green. It's very Cenobite Hellraiser. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Um, <clears throat> honestly, like 
I understand why it was definitely like the, one of the first ones done. I think Star Platinum is kind of a little boring because it's a guy. <laughs> uh, it's a guy who also, in a weird way, kind of looks like some of the Pillar Men from last season. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's kind of this very... I, I actually really liked the Pillar Men's design because it's that concept of masculine strength pushed to the point where it like does a full 180 and becomes feminine. And I kind of like that. Star Platinum doesn't go quite that far. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, Star Platinum looked like a JoJo. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and he's yeah. fun because he says Aura all the time. Um, I really like... Um, I like Magician's Red, actually. I like the Vulture Head because it kind of, it gives you that Horus reference of a bird-headed Egyptian god, but it's not an explicit reference. Um, and I like things that breathe fire, you know, so sue me. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I do like um, Holnerith Stand. Um, Silver Chariot, yeah. Sil Silver Chariot. Like Chariot's good. Like, uh, both in terms of the uh, sword fighting side of things, but also in terms of like having um, two phases, or both like the armored version and then dumping the armor entirely for for enhanced speed. Um, yeah, and the armor on Silver Chariot is it looks like bondage gear. <laughs> it looks like straight out of you know obviously nineteen eighties heavy metal spikes everywhere. <laughs> And yet it's also one of the sleeker designs, like, weirdly. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, Silver Chariot, great design. Silver Chariot rides forever, shiny and chrome. <laughs> no, that, that was... <laughs> I mean, Mad Max was back then, but that, that's the wrong Mad Max. Yeah. I feel like there was a bit of a... Um, Toe biter, not... Uh, from, from, not again, sure. from a tarot reader's point of view, there was kind of a tendency to take what you'd think would be the more powerful humanoid figures of the tarot, like the high priestess, the emperor, the empress, and make them small little creepy things. <laughs> uh, some more creepy than others, like um, emperor is just, it, it, it's a gun. It, it's a gun that lets you shoot bullets that you can curve. Yep. I mean, sure. Actually, I think that one is is, is, is pretty... Pretty spot on in terms of symbolism. And the emperor is masculine power and authority. And what says that more than a gun in your face? A gun wielded by an American cowboy. Exactly. Apologies to the gentlemen in the audience. <laughs> but uh, y'all did this to yourselves with the patriarchy. Sorry. <laughs> like, so the weird thing is, is like, while he's made as Western, I almost got more of... Um, it, it's the wrong type of gun, but like a Australian Western vibe from him. Um, I, I got more of like the spaghetti Western. Like, I mean, the, like uh, this is, you know, this is not true, like American Old West. This is aping for, you know, for the sake. This is hearing the stories and playing the caricatures. That's, that, that's, that's fair. Um, but I can see, you know, the, the, uh, the Australian Outback. Like, and I think it's the colonialism it, there. Like, I think specifically it's the hat. It's the the strings on the hat to tie it around the head. Mm. That, that that feels like more of an Australian thing. Um, you don't get that as much in like American West cowboy West. Australian. Cowboy Australian. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I do have an Australian hat. That's fair. God, uh, got that way back when. And then uh, I thought justice intrigued me quite a bit because I liked the idea that. When you are killed by it, it's technically by your own hand. Like the, the <laughs> yeah, justice was nebulous. It didn't have like an actual solid form, mm -hmm. and I actually really liked that idea. Um, oh, but gosh, if anyone listening is considering watching this show and you have trypophobia, the fear of weird holes, don't don't watch this don't. show. Don't. Don't. There's so don't. many weird holes. And and weird tongues. I'm sorry. I don't know what they were thinking when they uh, animated people's uh, tongues. I just... Uh, I can't. Uh, I can't deal with it. <laughs> yeah. And they knew what they were doing because there's so many shots of tongues just being weird going... I can't. Blah, 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 blah. I can't. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, both... Yep. Yeah, with, um... Kakuin and also the, um... Uh, the, the body swap... Um, or the the, the, the duplicate one. Yeah. Um, 
There were a lot of times when I was looking at the screen like, nope, nope, don't like that. Nope. No, no, <laughs> no. thank you, please. No, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. But those those two things in particular, weird holes and tongues, just... Oh. <laughs> Yikes. I was like, yeah. Um, so, look, looking forward to the second half, the uh, Egypt arc. Yes. Yes. I want to know what happens. Especially because, like, Dio has pulled a, <laughs> like, first arc Marvel Cinematic Universe Thanos moment where he's just been lurking. At some point, he's going to be like, okay, I'll just do it myself. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, one thing I've been really wondering about is that Dio has sent out these stand users as his minions. And I'm wondering, where are the vampires? That's true. Where are the vampires? And Dio, Dio doesn't seem to be, like, especially motivated, honestly. he Like, Inyaba showed up and basically gathered all these stand users for him and sent them out, is the impression I got. And Dio's just like, yeah, fine, whatever. I got I got blood to drain. <laughs> Lounging to do. <laughs> Posing to perform. Posing to perform, yeah. <laughs> I understand. My Vogue shoot is this afternoon. <laughs> All my energies <laughs> preparing to flip over backwards on my heels in a completely unnatural way. <laughs> I, speaking of which, Jotaro has probably the the easiest JoJo pose to do of all like all the signature JoJo poses. Um, it because it, it's it's you you kind of lean back a bit, you 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 turn while leaning back and point at someone menacingly. Oh yeah. Um, like. Like, that is the kind of JoJo pose where I could see, like, a pro wrestler just doing it as, like, one of their... Like, some pro wrestlers a big JoJo fan, like, I doing it as a signature thing. I would be shocked if that hadn't already occurred. <laughs> That's gotta be out there. I mean, the, the, Jotaro's look of long black coat, hat, and black pants, white shirt. I mean, it's so easy to do, I'd be shocked if a pro wrestler hadn't already done it. Maybe not, like, explicitly called it out, but... Yeah, like especially some of the during some of the promotions where like around Halloween they'll do like a costume battle royal kind of thing, and then some people will will just do their geeky stuff like, oh, um, one of the women's wrestlers is going to dress up as Melina from Mortal Kombat, and even try to do the um fan attack move in the ring. Um, that happened at WWE once, um, and that sort of stuff. So I I am legitimately surprised that hasn't happened. Either at some point in WWE or AEW or someplace like that. Um, if any of the members of the Acclaimed are listening, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Look up cosplayers on TikTok. Some of them have got the shit down. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you could just do a seat. Yeah, they could just be the JoJo's. The JoJo's. The first JoJo's. Wouldn't it be great if there was a tag team, te a tag team that was just JoJo's? <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> I mean, we had um, the New Day come out dressed as Saiyans at one point. Uh, yeah. Uh, Heck yeah. So I don't follow I, wrestling, and even I knew about that one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, hey, so, like, I understand Biggie has had to retire from in ring work due to spine injury, but um, on the other hand, um, Kofi's still wrestling. Um, and like the other, it's still got two other members of the New Day left. JoJo reference Do it. for <laughs> for your next big WrestleMania moment. Go for it. Um. So yeah, next month we are doing the back half of Stardust Crusaders as we are now in Egypt and heading to Cairo for the showdown with Dio. Oh Let's my hope it god! It doesn't take us another twenty-four episodes. <laughs> It's going to take us another 24 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, no! Only like 20, I think. I think, you know, the, the finale starts at like episode 21. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what we have left. Um, and again, this Who is a big... Who does Dio have left? He's run through all the major arcana. Who's going to be on his team? That's... Maybe this is where we get the vampires. That's, where I, well, that's what I want to know. <laughs> um, so this... So for, again, for where you can stream this, it is available for streaming Crunchyroll, Netflix, Hulu, I guess, did, which would be Disney Plus Abroad. Um, the Hulu version 
is the one that is uncensored for as far as the violence is uncensored. I did find that some of the shots, the censorship that they did for like really shadowing the, the, the blood and gore actually got in the way of understanding the action at some point. So um, if you're, if you are on Disney plus or have a Hulu subscription, this would, that would be the way I would recommend watching it. Or of course, you know, get the DVD or Blu-ray from right stuff. All right, so we will return next month. Heck yeah. And so if you enjoy listening to this, to this podcast, please rate and review on the podcatching platform of your choice. It really helps. Um, and of course, share with your friends on whatever social media that you prefer. Uh, Mastodon, Twitter, um, as long as Twitter still exists. Right. Uh, Pick a platform that's not imploding. <laughs> um, Which is what ha- these days. It, <laughs> that's Tumblr. Yeah. Tumblr Can't still explode what's already been crushed. Tumblr's back, baby. <laughs> Tumblr yeah, t- never left. <laughs> don't call Tumblr. The Tumblr's like, don't call the comeback. I've been here for years. Um, oh my God. And- the and, migration to Tumblr is, has been hilarious. Yeah. And also, uh, email us with your thoughts on um, on Stardust Crusaders, anime explorations with two E's, pod at gmail.com. Um, if we get response back, we can't, uh, responses back and something interesting to talk about, we will talk about them on the show. So. Yeah. Interact with us. Please. Uh, we will catch you all uh, next month bye bye Uh, next month bye bye